So, as you guys all know, um, we're, being, we're presenting this from the customer care group. Uh, today, you have the privilege of talking with uh, Jason and Andy. Say hi, Jason. How are you guys doing today? Uh, we are, Jason's our newest member of the customer care group. Um, uh, so direct all of your really tough questions to him, and we'll see, we'll see just how badly he knows that. Um, so this is the first time I've done a webinar without uh, our manager, Jen. Uh, so cut me some slack, guys, please. Um, anyway, it's pretty standard. We've done this before. Uh, I think we're on our, i got to get the number of webinars we've done. We're, we've been doing these since 2007. Uh, three a year, four a year, one every other month, skipping September. Uh, since we do our conference then. So, as per normal, uh, the audience is muted. You guys are automatically muted. Um, there is a chat box. <coughs> Excuse me, there's a chat box available to type in comments, and there's also a question section. Uh, if you guys have any questions, we'll answer them right here on the webinar. Um, our sales sales will be sending out a survey at the end of the, of the webinar. Uh, Please complete it so we know what to cover for the next webinar. Um, and of course, as always, we record this webinar. You can always view all of our previous webinars on our webpage at navient-inc.com slash resources slash video. So without further ado, let's get started on Integrate. So the modules we're going to be taking a look at today uh, include App Enabler, Work View, the Office Business Apps Integration, or OBA, as I like to call it. Um, Web Services Publishing, which is a new module. Uh, Guidewire Integration for Insurance Companies. Uh, Esri, which is uh, the latest version of ArcGIS. Uh, Geolocation Services. Uh, the EIS Integration in BizTalk. And the External Access Client, and then we're going to briefly go, go over the Epic Integration as well, the improvements that have occurred in that. So we will start out with uh, with Jason giving us the overview on changes in App Enabler in OnBase 15. All right, guys. So throughout the years, uh, Application Enabler has been focused on creating a toolbox to allow administrators to integrate OnBase with just about any application without code. Uh, in 15, there's a few new enhancements that will help connect difficult to enable applications with OnBase using Application Enabler. Um, one of the new ones is tag-based configuration for text screens and OCR. Text screens have been enabled for years with Application Enabler, but sometimes it can be difficult if the information on the screen wasn't consistently in the same location. Uh, for instance, if you look at this screen here, um, the post status in the upper right-hand side over there, you see that right now it says not posted. Um, should that status be changed to posted, um, the not would be deleted, and everything below it would actually shift up a line making it you know, a little bit different to look at it. Um, through, through normal uh, text-based OCR uh, configuration and app enabler, you have to specify a line and column index. You have to basically kind of zero in on the start of your data. And if it moves up a line, it's totally gone. You have to make a completely different enable uh, um, configuration for your app enabler. Exactly. So the problem is, is that when the status is not posted, you know, all the items on the screen move down an entire row. And since you don't want to make changes to the application itself, and in many times it's not even possible, this enhancement, um, the new enhancement they have allows you to have the application enabler find values you need by searching for a tag or a text value, and it'll assist in finding the data you need. Um, in this case, the tag is the PO number, and we know the value will always be to the right of the text, even if the information on the screen moves around. Uh, this enhancement applies to text screens of any screen being configured using the OCR option and is supported with AE Live in addition to the standard application enabler screen. Um, in this screen, showing the settings for the keyword PO number and application enabler configuration, you can see the new tag based options. Slide up one. Um, the keyword can be located in relation to any occurrence of the configuration tag, even if it's in a different row and column on the screen, like Andy was talking about. So as you can see here, what we're looking for is the PO number and you know kind of what comes out after that. So, so it works kind of like if you guys use uh, tag-based dip. Um, actually, don't know if we have anybody who does use tag-based dip, but no, no. Uh, you you define a tag as a piece of text that's never going to change, 
but can occur anywhere on the screen or in the OCR to text. Uh, and this works the same way in App Enabler. So you, you make a tag here in the tag value text box, uh, and then whenever App Enabler finds that tag, that specific text, it knows that this particular keyword is going to occur immediately after it. Yeah, which just makes it a little, little easier to, to, to configure in certain sense. You don't need to be using columns and rows. You're allowed instead looking for specific tag items. So that's one of the cool new things. Um, also in 15, application enabler leverages the data capture server to better serve customers using OCR to capture data from their application servers, or application screens, sorry. The data capture server provides more consistent OCR results and adds support for clear type fonts and supports non-Latin alphabets. Uh, application enabler takes a screenshot of the enabled screen when the event is triggered. It sends the image to the data capture service server where the image is processed and the data is extracted. The data is then sent back to the application enabler, which will use the results to retrieve documents, assist in indexing, or create a new document, all AE actions that are supported. Um, the improved OCR is even supported with AE Live. The round trip to the data capture server is nearly instantaneous and should not appreciably slow down AE performance. If you already own the data capture server, you can leverage your current instance. If you wish to set up another instance or need a license, it is free and can be obtained from your first line of support, which is us. Which is us. Exactly. Uh, yeah, this is kind of cool. Um, if you have a screen that you can't enable any other way than with OCR, um, in the past, App Enabler has had its own OCR engine, which is, has been related to the, the internal on based thick client OCR engine, which was good, but not great. Uh, as Jason mentioned, it couldn't handle clear type text, so if you had a web page in Internet Explorer using clear type, you were pretty much sunk. Um, this does, the new data capture uh, OCR engine is a lot more advanced. Uh, any of you who are using um, Autonomy Idle for your full text indexing, um, when you ship a, a whole bunch of TIFF documents over to Idle for indexing, Idle doesn't actually OCR those. That's the data capture server that does the OCR. Um, to give you an idea of how well that works, um, it's a big and powerful OCR engine. And being able to leverage it in uh, App Enabler to get that, to get that, you know, that last two percent of correct, you know, correct OCR is is major. So, and, and last thing to note is that the internal AE OCR engine has not been removed. If you, if you successfully enabled screens in the past with this engine, upgrading to the Onbase 15 will not affect your application neighbor configurations. So, good to know as well. Added feature. Added feature, exactly. All right, so I think next up, you've got work, work view integration. Yeah, some of the new changes to work view. Exactly. So, Introducing the WorkView integration for Microsoft Outlook 2013, new on base 15. This new integration is one of three WorkView and Outlook integrations we have already have integrations for, for Outlook 2007 and 2010. So regardless of the version of Outlook your organization has, um, you're covered. And if you are a WorkView administrator, um, we're going to take a look at the value of letting your end users leverage Outlook as their WorkView client much the same as our standard on-base integration for Microsoft Office does for the other on-base products. These WorkView integrations for Outlook extend the accessibility and value of WorkView as users never have to leave Outlook to find the data they need. Uh, as essentially, as you'll see, it saves the, users, the end user's time, speeds up the work process, and can improve service. Uh, some of the key features of this in integration, WorkView filters can be made easily accessible as Outlook folders. We can automate the access on-base data and documents related to the email sender, which is quite powerful. Uh, because if we can map aspects of the sender's email to an attribute in the WorkView application, when the user selects the email, the related WorkView data is automatically um, retrieved. And there's another few key features. Users can easily attach email messages and email attachments to a WorkView object. We can automatically synchronize our Outlook contacts with WorkView data, and because it's built on the Unity platform, it provides the same familiar user experience. All right. Yeah, I mean, WorkView, we don't have a lot of customers using WorkView. We have a lot of customers who are interested in, in deploying WorkView because WorkView uh, enables where, where workflow allows you to automate uh, document-related tasks that are consistent uh, and time-consuming. And work, workflow is very good at that. Uh, there are exceptions, 
and work view is really excellent at handling those exceptions uh, or, or working with uh, processes that are more data driven than document driven. So having, having work view integration in your Outlook uh, app makes this a, a lot more powerful. And then again, this is all about just allowing Outlook to be our work view client. And with all these additional bells and whistles, um, kind of adds you know, some nice features to it. So um, what we're going to look at here is it's a powerful ability to map an email address name or domain to an attribute in work view. And when we select an email in our inbox, we, automatic, we are automatically presented with the related data that exists in our work view application. Um, if you think about this as part of the part of an issue management solution. If you click on that customer email, WorkView can automatically present you with all of the open issues for that customer. Yep. And then, so you can see you select an email in your inbox. Uh, the WorkView integration automatically grabs that email address and looks at all the relevant WorkView objects uh, with that email address mm -hmm. and shows it to you in the right hand pane. Exactly. And as you can see, WorkView filters WorkView filters presented as Outlook folders allowing us to search and work with our WorkView data in the same exact way we do in Unity. So that is WorkView. Okay. Related to the WorkView uh, integration for Outlook uh, are the Office of Business Apps um, integrations. And those are the, the integrations for out from base in Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Uh, they don't get mentioned a whole lot, but we're going to run over what they do uh, and what they can bring to your organization here. Yeah. These are pretty powerful just because, you know, a lot of documents that, you know, people are working with, um, you know, instead of having to jump between application to application, it kind of allows it just to, to live within in the one you're using. So um, the Office Business Application, or as they like to call it, OBA, in Office 15, OBA. Yeah, <laughs> had one major enhancement. Uh, namely, the new workflow functions have been added to the on-base ribbon. These include the ability to execute workflow on a particular document and or show this document in queue in the full Unity workflow interface. Uh, this feature has added, this feature was added across all three Office versions, so 2007, 2010, 2013, and across all three Office business applications for Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. So that brings the other Office apps a little closer to parity with, uh, with uh, Outlook which has been, we've really been calling Outlook the fourth client for a while now. It's, it's got a lot of powerful on-base features in it. And now Word, Excel, and PowerPoint get to join in some of the party. Exactly. So when working on an Office document that is part of a bigger business process, like policy and procedure administration or contract management, users can finish composing, editing the document, and then send it forward to review approval directly from the Office application. So kind of the big feature of just you know not having to keep switching between applications, but kind of being able to do it all for them from one uh, application you're using. And that's the, that's the theme of this webinar, integrate. Exactly. All right, speaking of which, uh, a new feature in 15 is web services publishing. Exactly. So um, what's new with OnBase 15 and web services publishing? Web services publishing was introduced as a module in 14 to give more options to organizations that are seeking to integrate their third-party systems with OnBase. Um, web service publishing is a tool to quickly create a connection point between third-party applications and OnBase. The web service is created in OnBase Studio via point-and-click, user-friendly interface that does not require programming knowledge, which is pretty nice. The web services publishing module creates an MSI file that will be used to create the web service on any web server running IIS. Developers for the third-party system can then write it right to it in standard SOAP or REST web service. Yeah, it's, it's pretty powerful. Uh, if you've got external um, or even internal uh, web-based apps, ASP.NET or, or ASPX, uh, stuff like that, and you want to talk to OnBase, uh, web services publishing is the way to do it. Uh, it allows you to develop uh, a you know, standard ASP or JavaScript-based app and then call on-base functions through SOAP or REST protocols uh, that you can define when you build the web service. Mm -hmm. um, that means that your internal developers can use on-base and use the data in on-base without having to know on-base's API. 
it means that administrators, on-base administrators, don't have to learn how to code to administer this. They can point and click build uh, web services for their developers to use. Packages up, as Jason said, as a standard MSI. You can just deploy onto a uh, IIS web server. And OnBase responds to these commands in real time. You can update keywords, autofill keyword sets. You can create and uh, extract data from eForms. You can execute workflow from, from SOAP, from an external application. Uh, you can import documents over SOAP or over REST. Uh, and you can perform searches in OnBase using retrieval or custom queries. And the result can be displayed by OnBase you know, using a hit list pop or back through your application through the SOAP connection. So it's really powerful. It's a really cool tool. Mm -hmm. um, and the next thing is in 15, web services publishing has feature parity with EIS for all outbound operations. Oper outbound operations um, are a subset of features of EIS that comprise the actions initiated by the business application to OnBase. Because they're developed on the same platform, web services publishing benefits from the EIS development efforts. Yeah, I've got a, I actually have a screenshot here of what it looks like to configure uh, web services publishing. Right. You can see it's just, it looks exactly like configuring workflow or, or work view object in Studio. It's a it's familiar interface, point and click. You can define what functions you want to expose via the, the web service. Really easy to handle. Very nice. And as Jason said, it's got feature parity with EIS. Mm -hmm. well, and you can see here's a full suite of features that can be used by business applications accessing on base through the web service. You can see that's really powerful. We've got create, delete, read, and update Unity forms. That's pretty major. Execute Unity scripts. Perform batch scanning via SOAP. Yeah. That's, that's pretty major. Uh, like we said, work, workflow, you can execute workflow, uh, advance workflow, uh, add documents to workflow, uh, custom queries, import documents. Yeah, this is, this is pretty major. And of course, generate docpop URLs, uh, which is also uh, a big thing. I know we've got, we've got more than a few customers using docpop. And uh, this is a, a really quick and convenient way to build an app that generates docpop URLs. Yep. All right, so next up, oh, we've got, okay. they have a community page. Exactly, yeah. So there's also now a community page dedicated solely to web services publishing. So anytime, um, need any more information or kind of some self-help, um, you know, you can go to a, a community page where other people using the same software have either posted their questions or answers um, to different issues that, you know, other people are having. So, um, OnBase community is, is a really cool kind of place just for other OnBase users to trade ideas and trade solutions to uh, issues they maybe have. All right. So yeah. tell me, tell me, Jason. Yeah. If I'm a I'm a company. I'm using Guidewire services. Yeah. Can OnBase work for me? You know what? OnBase can work for you, and with OnBase 15, it can do it really well. So, um, just a little quick on what actually is Guidewire. So, um, OnBase integrates seamlessly with Guidewire, making information easily accessible, and simplifying claims, underwriting, billing procedures. Um, OnBase captures and stores policy-related documents electronically, linking them to the associated claims data and policy information in Guidewire. Uh, insurance staff instant instantly access those documents in Guidewire, improving decision-making and eliminating the need to search through multiple applications, file shares, or paper records. So, um, like I said, this is a uh, webinar talking about integration and um, the different kind of applications that OnBase will integrate with and Guidewire is one of the big new features that Highland has really pushed out um, with OnBase 15. So there's been greater linking support to 15 to extend out-of-the-box linking capabilities offered by Godwire. Um, this allows OnBase for Godwire customers to link documents through the Godwire insurance suite, even where Godwire does not normally support it. Um, multiple documents can now be linked to the same activity in Godwire Claim Center and the Policy Center via OnBase. Documents imported with two separate document types can now be linked in the same activity code via the workflow, as long as those document types are configured for the activity workflow. Um, with a lot of you know, different applications, you're going to have documents that need to be related to one another, and this is a really great way to be able to see all the related documents kind of in one place. Yeah, so if you have your policy data in Guidewire, um, now you can you know, tightly integrate on base. If you've got you know, supporting documents, claims documents in on base that are related to those policies, 
uh, now we've got a good, powerful uh, guidewire integration for that. Mm -hmm. to hopefully, uh, simplify your business process. Exactly. Um, and then the nice thing is that it is customizable for each customer's business logic because each customer has you know, a different process that, that works for them. Um, a workflow action checks for related documents in more, in more than one document type when this is configured. Um, however, the default is still single activity per document, um, and this is available across all centers. So on the next screen here, we can see that in this example, um, you can see the activity met with insured. It links to two documents, the loss history and the confirmation letter. Both these documents are very important as they relate to the activity, so this enhancement is quite essential to the user. Um, in keeping with the goal of simplicity for the end users, improvements have been made to the document viewing from the GuideWire interface. Instead of opening the entire Unity client, the documents will pop open directly in the document viewer. This can reduce confusion and training efforts for users of OnBase for GuideWire because it simplifies the experience for them. The admin screen gives an added glance view for the integration. Uh, for diagnosing the health and status of the OnBase GuideWire solutions, uh, displays information like whether the plugins are enabled and usage statistics for operations and queries. Um, this can help admins make changes to their solution as needed with more information at your fingertips. Um, as we know, the best practice dictates that every OnBase solution should have a minimum of a test and a production environment. Um, once you started integrating with the large application like GuideWire, it is even more important. You don't want to have downtime in either system stemming from changes you've made to the production system. In order to make the process easier, OnBase for GuideWare now features a migration tool. Um, this is designed to help customers move to move the BizTalk Visual Studio projects between the OnBase environments. Um, it can greatly reduce the time and effort involved and is available to OnBase for GuideWare customers from your first line support, which is Andy. Yeah, just me. <laughs> yeah. No, it's all of the Natty support team here, which is good. So, um, also another cool thing with GuideWire is that the new GuideWire API has been rewritten to allow for easier implementation. Um, we've learned a lot from deploying real solutions, and the rewrite incorporates those lessons to improve the overall solution. Uh, the new API automatically generates documents in the form of interactive Java doc to assist system admin. Um, and the last little thing of this is that there are new training videos that have been completed. Um, they are not intended as how to install a course, but they're meant to show you how to understand and administer a solution after it's been delivered to you. So as you can see there, they've also put, um, they're really doing a great job with not only bringing out new integrations and new support, um, but they're also really helping people get the most out of them by putting a lot of training videos and a lot of uh, tools that just admins or end users can use so they make sure they're getting the most out of it. All right, so pop quiz attendees, uh, are you guys using um, App Enabler? Let me know. I meant to do this when we finished our App Enabler section, and I forgot. I just got too excited, too excited about web services publishing. It is a cool feature. Okay, looks like out of our, our attendees, out of our huge audience, uh, we've got three are using it and two are not. Hmm. Well, that's cool. So those of you who are not, uh, we can we can do a demo of uh, enabling a Windows app uh, at the end of this. Yeah, uh, for sure. I think that'd be pretty cool. I think that'd be good. Yeah, good little feature. So. All right. If we have any questions so far? We're gonna we're gonna jump into um, Esri, the ArcGIS Esri integration, yeah. uh, which Jason's just chomping at the bit to talk about because he's this guy. So this guy came to us from a logistics company, so he's he's all about geolocation of data. Absolutely. Um, so I'm delaying as long as I can just to, <laughs> <laughs> just to make it <laughs> that much more annoying for him. All right, so why don't we continue on then? Let's go into this. So, integration for Esri. Um, before we begin, it's worth noting that in order to both reflect the new enhancements and the approach for integrating with Esri, they're changing the name from Integration for Esri ArcGIS to just Integration for Esri. Um, and as you'll see, the integration is now specific to the ArcGIS product. 
So first of all, what I'm excited about is that they've integrated uh, Unity with Esri, allowing you to dynamically display documents on a map. Um, while it's calling it map documents, it's so much more than just displaying the data and documents on the map. Um, it's showing how the documents and data relate to one another. Um, what this really is doing is it's, it's transforming data into business intelligence. So, um, you know, before we get into the analytics, we'll start looking at, you know, the map documents and, and how it really works. So, um, so what happens is you have a, uh, a document retrieval list that will come back and um, one of the options you'll have on there is to send documents or send to map documents. Um, once this goes, the documents are displayed on an interactive Ezra map, um, and you can add external content to the displayed map and upload an archive map on the on base. Um, what this is doing is taking, you know, you have to have the right kind of data, um, you know, data that has geolocations on it or, or addresses to be able to, to utilize this, but um, it's kind of a different way to look at your data and a different way to use your data. So, um, you know, a lot of different entities, a lot of different uh, areas of business, you know, you're going to have documents that are going to relate to either specific locations or have you know, customers with specific locations. And instead of just seeing the addresses and seeing the places where they are on, you know, a screen, this is now allowing it to be seen on a map, which makes it a little more real and makes it a little bit more able to be used. So um, if we take a look at the map, as you can see, this generates an Ezra map. So, um, what the example is looking at here is looking at for um, health inspections for different kind of restaurants and, and places like that. And you can see that the nice thing with this is that, you know, otherwise you would just have addresses that kind of list, you know, numerically or streets of, of kind of, you know, past and failed and, and such like that. But, you know, when you look at it on a map, you start to realize that you can see trends and you can see, you know, maybe there's pockets of places that are going to be all green dots, which are going to signify past, or you can see the red dots that are going to all signify they all know those can obviously apply to, to just about anything that you want to geolocate or put on a map. Um, you can notice that they'll do different color pins, which is completely customizable. When you hover over the pins, it'll give you information, um, similar to Google Maps, where you see the pin on the map, and you can bring it up, and they'll give you a little more information on there. Um, when you double-click on a pin, it'll bring up the documents that are related to it. Um, you can save the map into OnBase as an image. Um, now it's an OnBase document. You can route it, mark it up, do what you want to do with it. Um, you can also change the map. They can either be, um, you know, the simple standard maps here, or they can be aerial imagery, satellite imagery. You're going to have different options of what you want to do with that. Um, you can change your map back and have some external content, like nearest hospital, um, you know, other different types of searches that you can kind of rotate in with there on that. You can see above the green dots at the very top there, you have that other building that's signified there. Um, they've obviously located, you know, a hospital that's there as well, just to kind of look and see where the, where all the trends and where everything's located in one another. Um, what this is doing is also it's giving a visualization to the database information so now you can actually do something with it. You're going to be able to, to look at this information and, and kind of analyze it on that next level. You know, you're not just going to be looking for deltas between uh, you know, different, different statistics, but you can kind of look at this visually and say, all right, what am, I, what am I really looking at here and where am I going with it? So um, really cool. Now with this, though, there's obviously some software that's needed. Um, it's a, you know, this is a Unity-based project, Unity-based product. Um, you're going to need integration for the Esri license. Um, you're going to need an Esri account. Um, the customer, you know, you either have an AGUL, RGIS online account for an Esri portal account. Um, there is a 30-day free trial for um, AGUL that's available at the, uh, at the website, www.arcgis.com. Um, for configuration, um, geolocation enabled. Um, which includes address keywords, so then the user simply clicks from the ribbon or right-click to map documents. The Unity-based product is installed locally. Um, Esri, ArcGIS, Runtime, SDK, cross-platform, installed locally. And this is free and located on Esri's site. All right. So, like I said, a little bit of a summary. Um, this is just, you know, really cool functionality that does more than simply display documents on a map, but instead it transforms the data into business intelligence. It's a visualization of database information, something we can do with it, relate it to other data and make decisions. Um, and it supports geocoding, or world geocoding. So right out of the box, it is international. So this is not just confined to specific country or continent you are. This will go, you know, worldwide. Um, 
Yeah, this is just something, like I said, that I'm, I'm pretty excited about because, you know, coming from a logistics background, um, this could be applied in, in a lot of different ways. If you have a lot of different customers or clients that are going to have, um, you know, location-based decisions that need to be made about, you know, where are things either happening or where are they, um, this kind of takes it from just being different states, different addresses, different zip codes, and now lets you visually see it, and you can kind of sort out distances a little bit easier. You can visualize, you know, where are my strengths and weaknesses coming from? Right. So let's say you take um, take a look at like your sales orders, right? And you're like, well, where should we build our next distribution warehouse? Mm -hmm. And you have, you know, you look through your sales orders from the last year, and you've got, you know, well, there's 238 sales from Utah. Maybe we should build a, a distribution warehouse in Utah. Well, you can throw it. You can you can look at each one individually. You copy and paste the address onto Google Maps. You know, it's not going to tell you a whole lot. If you throw them all into Esri, you can see that, oh, well, actually, most of our orders are from Salt Lake City, so we should probably build the warehouse in Salt Lake City. But it's not going to help all of our people, you know, down in the southwest, cor southeast corner of the state. Right. Those, those four people there who ordered. Exactly. And, and honestly, automation is, is about, you know, simplifying processes, about giving you just that extra advantage tool. Well, this kind of ties... Esri in the on base and kind of brings those two together on there and it takes the documents that you already have and you know, as long as the correct information is with them, you can then apply that to the next level and you know get kind of a, a different feel and look for for the different um, you know data you can use out there. So um, do we have another poll? We do. Oh we have another we poll. We do have another poll. This is great. Uh, I would like to know if you think Esri would be useful for your organization. Does this sound like something you would use? Does it sound like something your staff would use? Your users would use? Does it sound like something your your managers would use? If you think about where all the documents, you know, you're going to have either either addresses with documents or um, locations where they're originating from, and think about how how can that be leveraged or used either operationally or on the sales side or on the marketing side. It's going to give you kind of a uh, um, now, now, now I'm pitching it, aren't I, Andy? Yeah. Yeah, all right. I'm, I'm sad to say, Jason, um, we've got 100% of our results in, and everyone says no. Oh, oh. I don't think it would be useful. Mm. Sorry, Jason. Well, my excitement will stay eternal. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, so that's Esri. Um, we've got one more here. Yeah, we have at least one more. We do. We have two more. This one I'm kind of excited about because I'm nerdy. Uh, this is uh, OnBase EIS integration or integration for BizTalk. Um, if you're not familiar with EIS or BizTalk, uh, this is a long-running, it's the, the latest in a long-running series of projects by Microsoft to try and integrate uh, all of the various network and database-based enterprise applications that are out there onto a common platform. Uh, and in this, in this case, uh, the EIS integration for OnBase is uh, means that OnBase joins this roundtable. Uh, in simplest terms, EIS, the Enterprise Integration Server, is is a big table, and all of your enterprise apps come to sit at the table, and they can pass information back and forth between themselves and each other. And the EIS integration for OnBase uh, enables OnBase to be a fully participating member of this information passing table. Uh, the EIS integration enables bi-directional data flow to and from BizTalk and OnBase. Uh, configuration, as with most of OnBase, is graphical, no code required. Um, the integration has built-in message retry and guaranteed delivery. So if you're, if you're trying to send messages from OnBase, uh, any of you who have HL7 or use the HL7 integration know how frustrating it can be when a message doesn't get sent and you're not sure why. Mm -hmm. uh, this is built-in retry uh, and guaranteed delivery handled by the BizTalk server, by the EIS server. Um, so this enables you to uh, talk to anything else that can, that can talk BizTalk. Uh, that's a lot of IBM mainframe apps. Um, you'd use you'd use like web services publishing to talk to a web app, but you could run a web app through EIS if you wanted to. Um, 
And anything else, I can make a network call and have custom code inserted into it. So like Brainware can talk to EIS through an EIS module. Um, what else can you go through? Um, SAP has an EIS integration. Uh, so you can have SAP and OnBase talking together over EIS. Uh, basically, it's a big, it's a big glue server. It helps you glue together all of your on, all of your your on-base and non-on-base enterprise applications. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, and uh, like we mentioned, Web Services Publishing has parity with the EIS integration. So all the stuff you saw that you can do with Web, web Services Publishing, you can do with the EIS module as well. Uh, open and create eForms. Uh, modify keywords, autofill keyword sets, uh, Unity forms, workflow, all that works through EIS programmatically. So I'm excited about that one. And somehow we don't have a poll as to see whether anyone else is interested in that because, yeah, I'm pretty sure I know what the answer would be for that one. But exactly. I'm excited about it. Uh, so heading up to the end here, we've got external access client. Uh, external access client was the old um, the old web portal uh, integration that we had for a long, long time since uh, since web server I think nine two I think integrated introduced the web portal. Uh, external access client is a revamp of uh, of that old portal the old portal uh, module. Um, it allows you to build a customized interface into OnBase for web-based users, for people who are restricted to a web browser, either they're you know external to your, to your intranet or you don't want them to have full access to OnBase but they still need access to some of the data in there. Um, it is a it is a self-contained portal system. You deploy it separately from the web server. Uh, again, point and click configuration of the pages and the page layout, including uh, styles, colors, uh, backgrounds and images, uh, and it's really meant for high volume access uh, to external to data externally from OnBase. Um, highly recommend for you know, more than, for 11 users or more, <laughs> which is adorable. Yeah. Um, but it is, it's a good lightweight web-based web uh, front end to OnBase. Wow, oh, gee, I've got some more notes on it. So we've got the same page. Awesome. Okay. So wow, I'll touch base on yeah, go for it. Yeah, the Epic integration. So um, there's been recent improvements in this integration for Epic that demonstrate why Hound is a leader in EMR. So electronic medical records. Exactly. So um, obviously there's been you know, a big Yes, binding between the two softwares and going between there. Um, right off of this, the integration for Epic allows you to interact with OnBase content directly from the familiar EMR interface. Um, you, know, you can effectively capture, retrieve, and manage all clinical and non-clinical information without ever leaving the Epic application real-time access to comprehensive patient medical files, including faxes, mixed media, EKG waveforms, exam results, significantly reduce the risk of patient misdiagnosis. Um, there's been a, how, how long has Epic been integrated with OnBase for since? I know at least 10, probably earlier, maybe seven. Okay. And so, yeah, so the nice thing is every time OnBase does do um, an upgrade, they have to add quite a few new improvements. And I think this last time around they had somewhere in the realm of 360 either enhancements, um, kind of, Tweaks and bug fixes or improvements, and we got to pull a couple of the uh, the key big ones out just to kind of highlight them and talk about them. But um, the nice thing is there is a, a you know a constant um, working to make sure that that is still running smoothly, smooth and seamlessly, and um, you know addressing any and all issues people have. So um, some of the main um, upgrades that have been you know brought to OnBase 15 is that you know users can now print Unity forms from the Epic Viewer, which is pretty nice. Uh, closing an e-form now prompts the user to save changes if any have been made in the desktop client. Um, I can definitely see how that would be very helpful. If you're still using the on-base desktop. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, they fixed an issue that could cause very high TPU usage 
and make the application server unresponsive when the service mail slot is, in, is enabled. Um, settings have been added in the ActiveX web client that allow the connection timeout to be defined. In cases of larger documents or slower network connections, the connection timeout can be increased to allow the client more time to load the document. The default for this value setting is 300 seconds. Hopefully it doesn't take more than five minutes to load the document. Very true. Fingers crossed. Right. Um, they've also added the ability to convert e-forms, uh, HTML documents, to PDF. That's pretty major. Uh, I know a lot a lot of folks would like you know to do initial data entry on an e-form and then convert it to a PDF and have it be read-only. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the MSI installer checks for prerequisites before before installing integration for Epic. I can see how afterwards may be a bit of a problem, but before is definitely helpful. <laughs> um, the last thing we wanted to just highlight out is that when a user group timeout occurs and there's an unsafe change to an open WorkView object or keyword, the user will no longer be prompted to save the changes after a timeout prompt is ignored. If the timeout prompt is ignored, the client will now exit out and the close and close without error, and no changes will be saved. Um, once again, there were hundreds of small tweaks and changes that they made. Um, these are just some of the big ones, but that does show that there is a constant improvement process with the Epic integration. So, you know, on base will stay current, and it'll stay, you know, with what customers are actually, you know, looking for and needing. On base is a is a really good. Uh, integration for Epic, um, using OnBase as your back-end storage for, for Epic documents. You know, you can, you can scan in, in Epic, have documents land in OnBase, go through workflow in OnBase to have, you know, keywords updated or data validated in workflow, uh, and then be available uh, in Epic seamlessly is a major, major thing. And the Highland is redoubling their efforts on, on the OnBase Epic integration. Mm -hmm. And this is just more proof as to uh, more proof to that that fact. Gotcha. So, so we've got about ten minutes left. Uh, yeah. I would like to show uh, for, our, oh, for right. our our two folks who have not used uh, App Enabler um, what it does. Uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, it's a neat little utility. So I'm gonna hop out of the presentation here. And hop into my OnBase VM. So I have, in this case, I've got. We don't have Great Plains here. We don't. We don't use it. Um, but I have a fake Great Plains app uh, that I just built myself. This is just a Windows app. Uh, it looks like the customer maintenance screen in Great Plains, uh, and it acts. It behaves like the customer maintenance screen in Great Plains. We've got text boxes that we can edit, uh, labels that we can't touch. Uh, pretty normal if you've used Great Plains. Should look pretty familiar. Uh, what we're going to do, this isn't really a good business use case for App Enabler, but it mm -hmm. makes a good demo. Right. Uh, and we're going to enable, uh, when we hit F6 on this screen, we're going to have uh, App Enabler pull the first line of the address over from this screen. So when we're in the Great Plains, we're looking up an address, and we need to say we need to update it in on base. Mm -hmm. I mean, in an actual integration, you'd use an external autofill keyword set that goes to your Great Plains database. Right. But in this case, to demonstrate what we can do with uh, with App Enabler. So to get started, I'm going to launch AE config up here. So App Enabler config lets me set up my enabled applications. So you can see I don't have any right now. So I'm going to add a new one. And we're going to enable these, these buttons here in the toolbar allow me to enable various screens uh, or applications. We can configure a Windows application, a text application, uh, HTML. We can go straight into Internet Explorer and actually pull the raw HTML back uh, for super reliable uh, HTML uh, website enabling. Assuming that you know the tag data in there doesn't change, um, we can enable a Java screen if we've got a Java app, uh, and then we've got there is actually a, a Great Plains integration for App Enabler, but we're going to use a Windows screen for this one. So if I click on Enable a new Windows screen, uh, the App Enabler config box disappears, uh, and what happens is my as I mouse around my interface, uh, things light up. And these things are the actual uh, Windows structures 
uh, in a program. So you can see, like, I can highlight a, a certain label. I can highlight this whole screen. I can just highlight this one uh, text box. What I want to do when I'm enabling an app is I want to enable the largest area possible that contains the data I need. Uh, so we can try and enable this uh, this box here. But let's say I want to grab, maybe later I might want to grab the address and then also maybe it's, it's um, <laughs> UPS zone or it's uh, zip code over here. In which case, I'm going to enable this whole window. So if I click it, we see that it grabs the name, the title bar name of the window, puts it in here in the caption value. So when App Enabler sees this program open, customer maintenance, it knows that, oh, I've got an enabled, I have an enabled hotkey here. Mm -hmm. I need to pay attention. So in order to pull this, this address out, we're going to make a new identification element. And again, it disappears and gives me the, the highlights here. Now here's where we pick our data. I'm going to say I want to grab this specific text field. And you can see it pulled back. It has pulled back the value that's in there. And every time I hit my, my configured key, it'll pull back whatever is in this text box. So if I make this, uh, so if I make this two apple cord, and let's try it again. We'll grab that same text box. You can see it grabs that value and it pulls it directly out of the app. This is the really powerful part about uh, App Enabler. It doesn't require OCR. This goes right in. It reaches right into the application and pulls the value directly out of memory. So we configure our mapping rules. If, if you have an application that has multiple windows, you can specify what window ID you want. Um, if you use those, go to Edit. You can see, when you go into Edit, you can see all of the all of the window hierarchy that's in Windows. This is a big, giant mess. This is how Windows <laughs> operates. But you can see it grabbed this particular text box here. And it, it has assigned it a, a, a unique identifier. It will always grab this text box. So if we hit Next, we've got our text box. It's going to ask me to log into OnBase. If you have auto login enabled, it will automatically log you in here. Mm -hmm. Live demos. <laughs> Nothing like it. Exactly. <laughs> so we're totally going to see that scanning demo, right? <laughs> <laughs> totally live. Unscripted. It'll be great. Yeah. There we go. So when, I, when we connect to OnBase, we can see all of my available document types. So, I mean, this doesn't really make sense, but we're going to do it on Pack and Slip. Why not? So we'll enable our, our Pack and Slip, and then this, turns, this returns all of our keywords that are associated with this document. Mm -hmm. So let's put in uh, <laughs> invoice number, via number. Put it in vendor name. We'll put it in vendor name. Yep. That's a terrible idea, but that's what we're going to do. Right, so let's go right at that guy. Vendor name. Here we go. We've got our enabled application. And in this case, the default event to pull this information is a left double click. We can change that. And we can make it anything, anything we want. So let's say we don't want a mouse event. Let's make it instead uh, F6. I'll just press F6. Mm -hmm. That's our keyboard event. And what we're going to do, actually, instead of retrieving documents, is we're going to index. Because we're going to move that, that data from that field over into OnBase. All right. And we have some extra options for if we're doing a text-based screen. In this case, we don't need to because uh, we're grabbing it over the clipboard. Everything's good there. So now, come into here, and I hit my F6 button, it's not going to do anything because I don't have OnBase open.
I'm telling you, live demos are the best. I know. They're the best. This is when we need more polls. Yeah. Well, we're doing all right. Got our app enabler up here. I'll have to load in my config file. So loading our app, app enabler uh, config that we just made. So we've got OnBase open. Let's pull up one of these POs. Back and flip, right? We enabled the back and flip. We did. Find all the back and flips. So we've got packing slip. Let's show the keywords. So we see the vendor name right now is Office Supply Warehouse. Mm -hmm. So we go over to our enabled app. We've got two Apple Cords in our address. We hit F6. Live demos, man. It didn't pull it over. <laughs> if I had configured it correctly, it would pull it over and we'd get Office Supply Warehouse, right in our uh, vendor name, our enabled vendor name Whoa. keyword. There it goes. Oh, there we go. It, and it has added a new one. It just took a little while. But yep. it's not surprising that this VM just booted up. Uh, hey, it works. All right. Hooray for live demo working. All right. So most commonly, the index action is used when you're actually, you know, indexing new documents that have just been scanned in. You've got, you know, break claims or something open in one on one screen. You've got your scanned in documents in the other. Uh, so when you bring over your data, and you're, you're, you'll be bringing over four or five or six or seven keywords at a time. You just hit one key. Yep. All the keywords come over. It doesn't make new instances of these keywords like it did here because not, they don't exist on the unindexed document. Exactly. That is app enabler. That is how simple it is to enable an app with app enabler. Exactly. And no, I don't want to say my modified keyword values. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully that gives you a better idea, a better idea of what app enabler can do. And again, you saw very briefly, I'll go back and show you that. Um, the things you can make an enabled app do. So let's you know, you don't have to just index. You can. Here we go. Action. You don't have to just index documents. You can. You have a lot of options as far as what to do when you hit that keyword. When you hit that that keyboard command and you pull that keyword data, you can you can compose a new document if you've got document composition uh, installed. Generate an e-form, generate a Unity form, generate a work view object. You know, if you've got, okay, so this is a, a brand new claims document. Well, I need to start the claims process. Hit your button. Boom. You've got a new work view object for your claim. Uh, yeah, we can do a folder pop, pop open a folder like uh, I have this. This uh, so you're looking up the customer in Great Claims. Hit your button. Pull up the folder in OnBase for that customer, showing all of their documents in OnBase. You can do just normal document retrieval. Um, Epic, you can retrieve deficiencies necessary for signatures. Uh, run scripts, upload documents. There's a lot of stuff you can do with App Enabler, and it's it is that easy to configure. Point and click, no code required. Works with basically any app. Um, sometimes it's more difficult than others, but we haven't found an app yet that can't be enabled. Right. So definitely a lot of a lot of power behind that one, and you know, comes down to, I guess, creativity, but also, you know, what what exactly do you want to utilize to? Yeah, to and, get it's, out of it. and it's dependent on your business needs. You know, if you've got an app that you have 100 users using an app, they've been using it for 10 years. You don't want to teach them a new app, right? You just, but you want to bring on base to this app. You can use App Enabler to do it. Exactly. 
Oh, well, that that is it for our webinar. There we go. Um, we've got our ECM blog at blog.navient-inc.com, uh, and then of course, as always, there is the Highland community at onbase.com/community. Uh, do we have any questions? Have any questions? Go ahead and ask in the questions section of the webinar. Mm -hmm. Like maybe three people are typing. Hang on. Maybe we might we might have questions. Drum roll. Let's hope none of the questions are why was Jason excited about every. <laughs> He's a logistics boy. Exactly. Gets excited, gets excited about location data. Wow. All right, looks like no questions. Uh, we'll just continue on then. Mm -hmm. uh, current version of OnBase is 15, version 15.0026. And you can see, as of OnBase 15, the pick client version and core services versions have merged. It's no longer a big, ungainly pick client version, and then the small convenient core services version. They are the same now. Mm -hmm. uh, Cofax Capture is still version 10. The VRS Elite is 5.1 still. Uh, Teleforms is still up to 10.8. If you have any questions, as always, you can give us a call at our support number, 1-800-686-8789, or email us at support at navient uh, And of course, you can always get to us on our live support on our web page. If you go to the customer portal page on navient-inc.com, look for the orange button. Those those go straight to our laptops. They make a really loud, annoying sound. You'll get an answer immediately. Yes. So what's coming up? Hey, we got our next webinar. Um, like we said, um, there is not a webinar in September. That is when um, our next Navient conference is, which is our summit for 2015. Um, Last year was held at the Harley Davidson Museum. This year it is going to be at Lambeau Field. So um, I think they've been, they kind of just got on the back end of all the renovations that were going on there. So um, nice two day event. Um, you can look on our website and it talks all about our summit. Um, just a lot of great resources and tools and you know, good interaction piece to, to meet with other OnBase users and other um, people in the, in the field that can you know, kind of exchange and great way to network too. Um, but that one will be in October. Um, up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So we love it. We love it when uh, a customer comes up to another customer and starts talking about how they use OnBase. Yes. How do you use OnBase? Well, we do this with OnBase. Oh, I didn't know it could do that. Yes. That's that's great because that means we can answer some questions. We can shed some light on a new feature or a new functionality that you didn't know OnBase could do. Exactly. And that's a great place to do it is at our conference. Right. So with that, um, our next webinar. Uh, will be November 18th, so if you want to jot that down on your calendars. Um, topic is to be determined, so we're going to keep you guys on your toes, and uh, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe big surprises underway. Um, guys, you know, there's there's so much in OnBase and so many tools and functionalities that we like to highlight um, that we want our customers to be able to utilize just to get the most of their business. So um, we always look through the surveys, we look through the questions that our customers ask, and we try to highlight you know, the most important pieces that we, we think will be you know, the most used to you guys. All right. Thank you guys so much. Have a great rest of your day, and uh, thanks for joining us on this webinar. Talk to you guys soon. Thanks, guys.